let's see. Hello, everyone. The, the image says that I am live, so here we are. Um, I am Gabby Goldstein. I am co-founder and political director at the Sister District Project, and I'm so delighted to be here with Dr. Carol Anderson, um, who is the author of White Rage, our, uh, our current book club uh, book, dog-eared, my copy uh, is. And um, thank you so much, Carol, for joining uh, thank us. Thank you so much for having me, Gabby. Thank you. Fantastic. So I'll say a few words about Sister District and um, and and Dr. Anderson, and then we'll jump into a, a discussion of the book. So I'm, I'm Gabby, as I mentioned, my, my training is as a lawyer, and my PhD is in health policy. So I come at things from a particular disciplinary focus, and it's always a delight to chat with sociologists and historians who um, come at things with um, a complementary set of frameworks. And so uh, I'm really grateful to you, Carol, for uh, for bringing that viewpoint um, uh, to this talk. So Sister District is a grassroots organization of over 45,000 volunteers across the country. And we're focused on electing more Democrats to state legislatures and highlighting the critical importance of state legislatures mm -hmm. as progressive policy pipelines, as leadership pipelines, and highlighting the importance of state legislatures in districting and fighting back against gerrymandering. Yes, yes. Thank so you. our sole our sole focus and mission is uh, is 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 sounding the the drum uh, over state legislatures. And among other things, we we have a book club. And I was so delighted when our membership voted for uh, White Rage to be our selection um, uh, this quarter. So Dr. Carol Anderson is Charles is the Charles Howard Candler Professor of African American Studies at Emory University. Her research focuses on public policy um, with regards to race, justice, and equality. And among many books uh, is uh, that she's authored is is White Rage. And I I just have to say it was a rather incredible circumstance for me to prepare for this conversation over the weekend, um, I was in Jackson, Mississippi, and mm. um, I had the opportunity to meet James Meredith. Wow. And, um, and, and talk to him, yes, uh, about his uh, experiences. Um, the University of Mississippi has just re reissued his book, mm. Three Years in Mississippi. And so he um, is, uh, uh, um, you know, g gave a, a little bit of a talk uh, from, from the book. And uh, to spend some time in, in ground zero of the civil rights uh, movement was a really, um, mm -hmm. uh, a really interesting opportunity as, as I thought about your book and, um, and, and where we can go from here and, and, yeah. um, and all of that. So just a few questions. Um, um, and and we will see how far we get. Um, but I, I've prepared a few questions around sort of the broad narratives and um, and and the main argument that that the book makes, um, as well as then a discussion of venues of power. I'm I'm an institutional. I'm a new institutionalist, and and so I really love thinking about um, how state legislatures and courts yes. uh, have have such have such uh, historical. Um, uh, uh, consequences and, and and all of that, and I think that shines through so much. And then a, a few questions about um, you know what's next for us and what we can learn from history in, in moving forward. So um, just to kick things off, in terms of uh, you know the the main argument, I think is just so powerful that um, as, as I understand it, but you know what, what would love to hear uh, more. But really, the idea that um, you know that the, the the flames that that uh, that the media and the, the mainstream narrative present around black rage um, really, uh, you know, obscure the the kindling, the uh, what lies beneath, which is um, the 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 quieter, uh, less visible white rage that works subtly through the venues of power in this country. So I'd yeah. love to I'd love to hear more. Well, you just nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> No, but it, one of the things that struck me, I was, I was here in my office, and um, I'm, I've got the TV on as I'm working, and Ferguson is blowing up, and the media representation of that was so ahistorical, flattened, and 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 it didn't get at what was going on, and so you got this sense of wow, look at the rage, look at black people burning up where they live. 
And, and, and without the kind of understanding, putting it into his historical context, putting it into its policy context, and what those policies had done to bring us to that moment. Um, without that, then we just get this thing flaring up as if there, there's nothing going on except this black rage. And I was like, no, uh, no. <laughs> and, and, and I started writing. Um, and in that writing, it just started pouring out of me. Um, this, this, this history, this history of these policies that systematically undermine African-American advancement, systematically undermine African-Americans access to their basic civil rights. And, and how it is black advancement, not just the presence of black people, but advancement, aspiration, achievement, that in fact causes these policies to rise up, to figure out how to, to undermine them, to, to, to put black people back in their place. And so as I started working on this, it just, it became very clear that there were these epochs, these moments, that were so crystal, such as um, after the Civil War, when African Americans moved from being property to human beings, citizens. The backlash was intense in terms of, you know, so we think of again, we think of the violence, we think of the lynching, we think of, of, of the cross burnings, but what we don't think of are the policies that were put in place, A, that sanctioned that violence, made it acceptable to do that, and two, the kinds of policies that undermine those citizenship rights. And so I track it from the Civil War to the Great Migration, to the Brown decision, um, to the Civil Rights Movement, and then to the election of Barack Obama. Absolutely, absolutely. And in thinking about those, those venues of power, the quiet places where institutionalized racism flourishes mm -hmm. in, in, in the shadows, in the quiet you know, halls of, of those Capitol buildings and office buildings and all of that. Um, I'm curious for your perspective in thinking particularly about the role of state legislatures. And it, it really came through so clearly in throughout the history that you tell, um, you know, from, from being the, the ground zero for black codes after the Civil War, coming from Mississippi as the first state. And I, I toured the old Capitol Museum yesterday and, yeah. um, you know, was, was in that room um, to the anti-enticement staff statutes during the Great Migration and all of the legal machinations during yeah. the Civil Rights Movement um, up to today, right, yes. where, where reproductive rights and voting rights are, are, are increasingly coming back to the states. And so I'm curious for your perspective, um, you know, historically and today about this, these critically overlooked venues of quiet white rage, the, the state capitals across our country. Absolutely, we spend a lot of time thinking about the White House and, and particularly this White House. But when you think about the way that power affects our lives, our day-to-day -day lives, from things like zoning laws to the way that schools are funded um, or not funded, to the ways that um, school boards are set up or that the state takes over um, a local government or a local school board. To, to, I'm in Georgia right now, and you know we're dealing with what they call a heartbeat bill or something oh, to that effect. Yeah, Mississippi, so, Mississippi just passed it a few weeks ago. It's one of those model pieces of legislation that's in the rounds that the, the conservative movement is so uh, strategically excellent. At, right, at you know, and, and I, I, I think about basically, in, in, you know, in Ohio's legislature just passed one and the governor, Mike DeWine, just signed it. Um, that basically what it says is that this is a forced pregnancy bill. Um, and, and you saw in the state legislature in Texas, where uh, a representative um, proposed legislation that if a woman has an abortion, she can get the death penalty because 
pro-life. Um, and, and so you see the, the power of these state legislatures in terms of regulating the kinds of lives that people can live. I see it in the work that I'm doing now on voter suppression, the power of these state legislatures in crafting these laws. So yes, the US Supreme Court gutted the Voting Rights Act, but it is what these state legislatures did via ALEC, the, the, uh, the organization. American Legis, yes, <laughs> oh yes. The American Legislative Exchange Council. That's it. That that these things just metastasized yes. throughout the United States and the power of voter suppression. Um, and again, we can, we see it, we get it when we're looking at the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma and we see protesters wanting their voting rights, demanding their voting rights and being trampled by horses. We see the horror of that. But what we don't, and we respond, what we don't see, for instance, were the, the 16 million people purged off of the voter rolls in two years between 2014 and 2016. We don't see it because that's quiet and that's happening. It's not the federal government that's doing the purging. It's state governments. It's the state, the secretary of state doing the purging. So when we think about the power of the state in the ways that we live our lives, in the ways that we can vote, in the ways that we can control our own bodies, um, in the ways that we figure out where we're going to go to school, in the ways, for instance, in the kinds of wages that we can get. So when you have state legislatures that then undermine ballot initiatives that deal with a minimum, a $15 minimum wage, um, all of those things are coming out of the state legislature. So thank you for this movement um, that you're doing, this, this grassroots organizing that you're doing, because what these states can do is basically make or break democracy. Totally. And it's unfortunate in many ways that the, the idea of states' rights is such a polluted and, you know, evil you know, has become so polluted and evil, right? I mean, because there is a way, a positive way in which um, states can and should, I, I'm here in California in Berkeley, and, um, you know, we're very proud of our state legislature and the, the power that California policy has has had in the rest of the country, the California effect in, in cars, uh, car standards and so forth. But the idea of states' rights, you know, going back to the Civil War, to the Southern strategy, although Candace Owens doesn't seem to <laughs> think that <laughs> that's a thing. I don't know what's the art. Bless her heart. <laughs> but, bless, bless her heart, I guess. I mean, I, I don't know. Um, but, you know, but, but there seems to be a, um, a general theme historically of the, well, at least in the present history of the federal government receding from a protective or enforcement role when it comes to civil rights and voting rights and all the rest and more falling to the states in a way that plays, you know, in a way that I feel, um, uh, progressives are at a disadvantage because the ownership over the idea of states' rights has been so, has such a historical context going back hundreds of years on the other side. I'm curious for your perspective. You know, and, and I think that this is where being um, flexible and nuanced and understanding what the ultimate goal is, 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 is what is absolutely necessary in terms of organizing and mobilizing and theorizing through how do we get from here to there. So one of the things that we know, for instance, um, is that there are state governments that are really reactionary and retrograde and do not believe in civil rights, do not believe in women's rights, do not believe in environmental rights, do not believe in LGBTQ rights. We know that, and they have demonstrated that. And that's how we have come to think of states' rights, because that right-wing reactionary um, um, mobilization around how do we suppress the bulk of our population has been a leitmotif 
It was the leitmotif when they, the, the, the South hollered states' rights, when, you know, uh, the North said, you know, expanding slavery beyond what we've got, we're just really not cool with that. Well, you're violating our states' rights. And, and, and that taint um, has lingered. It, it came through in the era of Jim Crow. Um, where when you would get the 14th, 15th Amendment, uh, the states would holler states' rights. And the feds backed off for a long time. And so it took grassroots mobilization and, and the Cold War to really expose these fissures and the, the, the uh, Wendell Wilkie, a uh, former presidential candidate, called it the mocking paradoxes. Uh, in American society, where we're the greatest, you know, the greatest democracy of all time, leader of the free world, you got Jim Crow, uh, you got lynching, you've got massive disfranchisement. Democracy doesn't do these things. And so it took the Cold War and massive grassroots mobilization to finally get the federal government to move in. Yeah. And in that came that language of you are violating our state's rights. And so again, we see that narrative, that light motif coming through. But let's talk about like where we are right now. So yes, we have a, a Georgia that has consistently implemented voter suppression laws, particularly as our population becomes more um, diverse demographically. So increasing voter suppression laws. On the other hand, you have a place like Oregon that implemented automatic voter registration and, and, and because they weren't satisfied with having over a 60% voter turnout rate. They said, okay, what, what is that? And so when they did that, not only did their voter uh, um, turnout rate go up by four percentage points, but their, their, their electorate became more diverse as well. Secretary of State Alex Padilla looked up and he went, oh my gosh, we can do that. And so you see California implementing automatic voter registration, but going one better saying, you know what? Let's pre-register 16 and 17 year olds. That way, when they become 18, they're automatically registered to vote. When folks get into the habit of voting, it's a hard habit to break. Yeah. And so, right. And so you see these states like California, um, Minnesota, Oregon, um, really taking on how do we expand voting rights? Whereas you have these other states that are about how do we restrict voting rights? And so yeah. just to say states' rights really doesn't cover the range of states and the vision that these states have of what a thriving, viable democracy looks like. And so what Absolutely. we're- Absolutely. And yeah. it's, it's, uh, it, it is a correlation. We, we can't do causation in social science, but it is a correlation between which party controls the state legislatures in the states that have uh, put forward those regressive or progressive voting rights um, laws in their state, as well as secretaries of state um, and so forth. And so I, I totally agree. And I, I think that there's, we're, I think that progressives, uh, po progressive policy folks um, are leaving uh, too much on the table still in terms of policy transfer. We certainly have those concepts in political science and we can mm -hmm. track them, uh, mm -hmm. but putting them into practice uh, in, in, in the real world is something that I, I see a lot of um, potential and optimism for uh, in the progressive space. But hey, and, you know, and, and I've got to say, one of the things that I also find hopeful, even in some of these kind of darker moments that, we, that we're in right now as a nation, um, is that when the Democrats, there was a group of Democrats in New Jersey that tried to put through a extreme partisan gerrymandering bill, right? But that there was a powerful constituency of progressives who said, no, not today. That's not who we are. That's not what we do. This is about democracy. This is about democracy. We're not having it. Unfortunately, we don't have that same kind of engaged citizenry 
on the right. Yeah. That looks up and says, uh-uh, this is not who we are. And that has the power and the influence to back folks down. So that is part of the asymmetry that we're dealing with right now in this nation. Um, but what I also see, I mean, so it's like watching the policies roll out. What I, what I also see is that for us as a nation staring basically into the abyss right now, we are on the precipice, but people are fighting back for democracy. When I, I think about the, the 2018 midterm elections, yeah, um, when you see the, the, what flipped, what, seven governorships? <laughs> um, uh, when you see this massive turnout, a uh, higher voter turnout than we've had since 1914 in the midterms, um, when you see the kind of ballot initiatives, like we're coming out of Michigan, where the, you have these citizen-driven initiatives because they understand that the state is not working. When you can have an ad that talks about pure Michigan, but what you've got is Flint has not had clean water for over 1800 days. There's a problem. And the people were not satisfied and did what they could in terms of ballot initiatives for um, nonpartisan redistricting commissions, for um, automatic voter registration. I mean, for so restoration, all, restoration of voting rights in Florida, also yes, by ballot initiative. Yes, I mean, so these, these are those moments of hope where you see the people really fighting back hard and understanding that the work is on all levels and it, it, we do ourselves a disservice if all we pay attention to is what's, what's in DC. We've right. got to pay attention to what's happening locally. We've got to pay attention to what's happening at the state level as well as the national level. Absolutely. I totally agree. And, um, you know, and I think that there's, a, what shines through so beautifully in your book is, are the historical threads that bind these ideas over time. Yeah. And there's so many um, that I picked up just as I was reading through the, the way that when, when you yank on the, the chain of history, you get back to these themes having been in place for, for, for so long, for good and bad, right? The, the idea of, of citizen movements and um, in a positive way, but also these more regressive um, themes and, and leitmotifs that as you, you know, as you aptly say, and, you know, I know we don't have too much time, but there were a couple of those that struck me and I really wanted um, to, to sort of get your, get your thought. And one was around um, the idea of the, the current prison industrial complex. Mm -hmm. And um, what came through to me in reading the historical account that you provide is the idea that really this goes back to, you know, the, the well, it goes, it goes back to the, the antebellum period, but the, in the post-war shift of yeah. the control of black bodies from plantation owners to the carceral state. Yes is the seed that, and, and, and from a historical institutionalist perspective, the path dependency that has come from that shift remains to this day. And I, I'm just so curious for, for your perspective, if you see it that way too, if you see the present um, uh, carceral state and the obvious disproportionate impact uh, on communities of color as a direct product of, uh, you know, that, that goes back that far and the decisions that were made um, early on having those long-term consequences and setting an institutional logic for what we see today. Oh, absolutely. So part of it is that you get this, this kind of criminalization of blackness. It is simply the blackness of the body that is criminalized. And then you attach laws to that, that blackness. Um, that so coming out of the Civil War, you had these vagrancy laws. Now, black folk weren't vagrant. They were either looking for their families, looking for work, but 
not vagrant, but it, the, it was the need. And, and the South, remember, the South is destroyed. Lots of people are moving around. But that Black body moving around criminalized. And it allowed them a way to use the laws of the state to then control that black body and particularly control that labor, to continue to extract labor from that, that black body. There's a, a wonderful book by David Oshinsky called Worse Than Slavery. And it deals with the creation of parchment prison. Yes. Yes, right, in yes. Mississippi. And that book is phenomenal in laying out the institutional mechanism that created parchment um, by, which, which was basically a large functioning plantation built in the 1890s. And so he takes us through and he takes us all the way to when you think about it, um, the freedom riders in the 1960s were thrown into parchment prison. So we've got moving from the rise of Jim Crow in the 1890s to parchment prison in the 1960s to when the, the, the federal government, the federal uh, judiciary finally said, uh, what you're doing in parchment, I think this was sometime in the 1970s, not quite right. So you've got this really long embedded history in there. We see that as well with um, the great migration. One of the things that struck me when I started doing the research on the Great Migration was the use of criminalizing Black movement, again, as a way to, so again, vagrancy. So if you're standing at the train station, get it with a train ticket in your hand, um, you can be arrested as a vagrant and then put in a, on a chain gang. And that was a way to try to keep that black labor there, but do so in legal ways by criminalizing that person and making them a felon. Yeah. Uh, and, or, oh, totally. And I and and also it seems like, like the thread comes through in the 1980s and the Reagan. Um, I mean, uh, frankly, my one of my favorite chapters of your book was. Uh, tying the threads together around the war on drugs and the Reagan administration's mm -hmm. role in the manufacturing of of uh, the the drug crisis, I you know it was something that I was not uh, aware. Of. I mean, I didn't know the, all of those pieces, and you know the current the you know the the idea of of what this well obviously the Supreme Court in the seventies and eighties also played a part there, but the idea of the, the ways in which mass incarceration um, were a continuation of that path dependency in the logic of the criminalization of black bodies in a differential way yes. to white bodies over time, over hundreds of years, um, it, it seems as though there's a thread there. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I mean, it, and, and, and again, it's so... We, and, and that thread is, and that's part of the thread that I was working through was after the Civil War, when Black people become not property, how do we re-enslave them? Ah, via the criminal justice system. In the Great Migration, when Black people, I mean, Isabel Wilkerson talks about this was the first step that the servant class ever took on its own without asking. That kind of sense of self-determination, of agency, of doing the whole American dream thing, which is, and, and, you know, and doing the capitalist thing, where you know that labor has the right to take its labor to where it can get the best resources, where it can get the best wages, where it can get the best working conditions. And so to have then these local governments say, you cannot move for a better job. We have laws on the books that say black people cannot leave the city to look for other employment. Think about that. That is just, that's just amazing. But so you've got black advancement and you have these policies using the apparatus of the state to in Absolutely. fact then incarcerate black people for daring to, 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 to want a better life, to want to be in a space where they may be able to afford to live. Um, we see it again 
after the civil rights movement. Because here now you've got the Civil Rights Act of 64 and the Voting Rights Act of 65. That's some serious advancement if it's implemented. How do you knock it back? Because the Southern strategy. Boom. Yeah. And, 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 you know, and you think about it, I got this question um, uh, last week that, that, and it was about, well, how did this carceral thing come about? Where is it? constitutionally. And I said, well, you know, when you think about it, the 13th Amendment, basically where it says thou shall not have slavery, it said, except in places where you have been incarcerated. You know? and, and so we have an if then but clause sitting there using incarceration as a way to eviscerate rights. And so that's part of the thread that's already also coming through in this. And so we see that fully with the war on drugs. Absolutely. And the commodification of black body, right? Because the prison industrial complex is a, a profit motivated yes. business yes. venture yes. where the commodity is disproportionately black bodies. Yeah, I mean, and, and you also think about it. I used to work in Ohio. I used to live there and work there. And during the, the, the rise of mass incarceration, and this is as the industrial economy is collapsing, right? Watching rural areas bid on getting a maximum security prison and seeing it as an economic development tool for areas that have been deindustrialized and to move then black bodies down into basically white rural areas. Um, and there's a whole mix that goes with that. I mean, so you're seeing the policy um, apparatus in full gear to figure out how do we stream enough bodies in here so that we can keep this enterprise going. And, and, and the laws that are created, so the, the, the differential between crack and cocaine, 100 to 1 in 100 to the one. And, thing. and so could you imagine um, writing a DUI law that says if you're drunk on a uh, wine that has a screw cap, <laughs> you only, but if you're drunk on uh, Dom Perignon or something, right? You know, so that the differential depends on the cost of the alcohol. It's insane. I mean, right. it, it, it's purposeful. It is an intentional. It's intentional. Yeah. So yeah. It, it 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 is it is watching these policies, and we you know we see the same kinds of um, when when we look at the policies of, of felony disfranchisement, for instance. And so this is again how it affects and undermines what had happened in um, the civil rights movement. So after those hard won battles for voting rights, because prior to that, I mean, like in Mississippi, fewer than 10% of African-American adults were registered to vote. Um, it was closer probably, eh, well, I won't say that, but fewer than 10% um, in the early 1960s. Yeah. Mississippi is was 45% black. How do you have, right? So. Then after the Voting Rights Act, by 1967, you have almost 60% of African-American adults registered to vote. This is, whew, this is a seismic shift. How do you cut that back? Yeah, and I mean, it was, it, it's crazy. I mean, in a certain way, it's, it's you know, the Shelby decision, um, uh, it was interesting. I the last book that we read for our book club was "Give Us the Ballot" by Ari Berman. Yeah. And so and and I, I had a, a chat, um, a fireside chat with Ari, and we talked about um, this that that John Roberts. I hadn't really understood before reading Ari's book um, 
had basically had it out for the Voting Rights Act for decades. Yes. Like he had been waiting and his entire career at the Justice Department, um, you know, was uh, coming up with other, you know, memos and ways to 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 eviscerate the Voting Rights Act. And and um, and so, you know, it's it, it's that, that too had a historical context yes. uh, for for that. Uh, for that decision, but um, but but absolutely, I mean, it's um, it, the what what is happening now in the post Shelby world, uh, where where the VRA has so few teeth, um, is is profound and goes back to what we were talking about before, where the federal government is in is is in a posture of retreat when it comes retrenchment, I guess you could say, when it comes to civil rights and voting rights. You know, and, 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 you know, so, you know, the last chapter in White Rage is how to unelect a black president. Um, Obama, Obama's victory was like a, a catalyst, a, a shock to the system. And, and you saw the, 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 the energized, mobilized sense of how, you know, Mitch McConnell talking about our goal is to make him a one-term president. Um, you saw the obstructionism. You saw the hatred. One of the things that I focus in on there is that you saw this massive push then for disfranchisement of what I call, you know, so one of the things that people say is, well, how racist can America be? We elected a black man twice to the White House. And and that we means that we white Americans elected a Barack Obama to the White House twice, except whites have not voted in the majority. The majority of whites have not voted for a Democratic candidate for president since 1964. Since Lyndon Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act and said they're going to put the power of the federal government behind honoring and enforcing African-American citizenship, you have not had the majority of whites vote for a Democratic candidate for president. And that happened in 2008 and it happened in 2012. What did happen is that you had a sizable number of whites who voted for Barack Obama, but you also had 15 million new voters come to the polls, overwhelmingly African-American, Hispanic, Asian-American, young and poor some combination of that. When you look at voter suppression laws, those are the targets. African-Americans, totally. you know, right? And, right. And, and this is, and but it's cast as protecting the integrity of democracy. The voter yeah. fraud, the voter fraud right. narrative, right? Yeah. 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 To totally, and and it's such a, a specious uh, claim and argument. And, and, and the other thing that, uh, you know, I'm not, well, I shouldn't say, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, my theory of change, let me put it differently. My theory of change does not involve convincing uh, uh, all the, the Trump voters why, why they're wrong and why they shouldn't vote for Trump again. That's not my theory of change. My theory of change is very much uh, aligned with the idea that we have, uh, that the new American majority and the rising American electorate is what we need to bring bring progressives into power forever, for the rest of time. And the reason why we don't get there is because of voter suppression. And it goes back to uh, those, those Republican controlled state legislatures that have passed those bills. And the other piece of, of of what happened in terms of, uh, you know, the post post Obama's election was the 2010 takeover of state legislatures by exactly. Republicans with the red map strategy. They knew that they had lost uh, the presidency and they looked really strategically at what was left and yeah. were incredibly successful in 2010. And of course, that they got to, to run the map app because the, 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 that was when the last census happened in the last round of districting. And it makes this work uh, now even uh, more important because as we head into the census next year, um, whoever we elect this year and next year to state legislatures will be drawing the district lines in, in those 34 states where, where that's still the case. Oh no, Carol, did I lose you? Oh no. 
I think that I've lost Carol, which is very, very sad for me. Well, um, I will give her a second to rejoin. In the meantime, um, I want to thank everyone for uh, for joining us for this fireside chat with uh, Dr. Carol Anderson. Oh, there she is. Carol, are you back? Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I for have no back. idea what happened there. Okay. Thank but you for coming back. AP did a, a recent study looking at the 2018 midterm elections. And because of the extreme partisan gerrymandering, they calculated that the Democrats would have gained 16 additional seats in Congress and flipped seven additional state legislatures if not for extreme partisan gerrymandering. That's the power of gerrymandering. The power of voter suppression. I, I mapped this out in the other book, One Person, No Vote, um, is that with voter suppression, Trump did not win the, Trump did not win the popular vote. He won the electoral college vote. And that required just 77,000 additional voters in, in a couple of key states, a few key states, one being Wisconsin, where you had extreme partisan gerrymandering. You also had Scott Walker in the Republican legislature, as one guy said, being giddy over figuring out how to suppress the vote in Milwaukee and in that liberal bastion of Madison. Right? There were 60,000 fewer votes in Wisconsin in 2016 than there were in 2012. 68% of that drop happened in Milwaukee. Trump yeah. carried Wisconsin by 22,000 or so votes. Yeah, yeah. This is, this is the power of voter suppression. It, it so warps. It, it so warps our being as a nation, the way that we can live through um, our existence in, in this nation. Um, and we are seeing that warping happening at the local and state level. That's why, again, the work that you're doing in understanding the power of state legislatures. Um, it is California standing up saying, no, we're, we're, we're we're not going to uh, send our National Guard to do that mess that you have going on on the border because you know what? That's some fictive stuff. That is just mess. We don't want any part of it. Yeah. Having state governments do that work. And so this is why we have to, as, I, as we started off on this conversation, being much more nuanced about the issue of states' rights. And, and, and understanding that um, the right has tainted a lot of stuff. You know, they've tainted patriotism. Um, they've tainted so much. But when you really look at the fight for a viable, thriving democracy, that is the work that really is being done by progressives. Yeah. I, t I totally, I, I agree. And I find that to be a very hopeful and optimistic message. Um, and I apologize oh that gone over time. <laughs> Thank you <laughs> so much, Gabby. <laughs> this has been so fantastic. I'm, I'm so grateful to you for writing the book and for all of your work and for taking the time to chat today. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs> Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye.